Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is Millie. Thank you so much for joining us for our virtual event this Sunday. Um, and we're so happy to have Julie Hobbs with us today. I'm presenting on this very important topic. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hand it over to Julie. All right. Thank you so much to the NFA for um, allowing me to present on this topic that has meant a lot to me. Um, I will share with you just a brief um, origins of how I got into exploring this topic in the first place. I was surprised by the number of my own students who were music education majors who started out college saying that they wanted to be high school or perhaps collegiate music educators. And then jumping ahead four or five years that by the time they graduated, they all landed very successful positions at the elementary or middle school level. And at the time, I didn't think much of it. I just thought maybe their, their plans had changed or their interests had changed. But then I started thinking about it as a larger picture. If this was maybe not just unique to my studio, but perhaps um, indicative of a, of a larger trend in which highly qualified female music educators were being encouraged, funneled, uh, stereotyped into a position that they had not intended to, to end up in. So those were the origins of my um, curiosity and looking into greater trends that were happening throughout the United States. I would like to say at the onset that my um, presentation was limited in not just all gender disparity, but um, specifically instrumental music, and even more specifically to band, since that was what, what I was seeing with my own students. So I'm going to be highlighting some of the disparities, both from the student's perspective, all the way through people entering the, uh, the profession. And so I'm going to do a screen share. At any point, if you have any questions, feel free to pop up in the, in the chat. I will leave some room for questions at the end, but I have a lot of material to cover. So if I don't get to your question, feel free to just shoot me an email um, and hopefully, yeah, I can answer your questions as we go. So um, one of the things I wanted to also define was that as a for statistics, I was finding that they were a binary definition of gender. So for my, for my friends, um, more curious about a wide number of voices. Um, this particular presentation is also limited um, in, a, in a binary male and female, but I think it also demonstrates the fact that I couldn't find many statistics on non-binary non students and professionals that more research needs to be done in that area too. So I is not my intention to omit those voices, but rather to highlight the fact that we need to know more so that we can include um, others in, in our understanding of the situation. So one of the things that blew my mind was looking at the percentage of participation, um, female to male students, both in high school music classes. So this was an M MENC statistic, nationwide participants in high school elective music classes, that would be general music, choir, orchestra, and band, was 70% female. Um, and only 30% male, which was a disparity of, that should be very concerning to us, that as educators, we're not necessarily reaching the needs of our male students at the high school level. What I found later was that as those same students go off and enter in college, college music majors, that number starts to kind of balance out a little bit more. 61% are female, 39% are male music majors of all fields of music. So that includes performance as well as music education. And then as those students leave the workforce, uh, enter the workforce, leave college and enter the workforce, um, the music labor force in general is pretty, pretty nicely balanced, 53, 47. But when you break it down into subspecialties like elementary music ed teachers, this is where we start to see a complete switch where we did have 70% of participants now in elementary music, the teachers teaching those subjects, 80% female, 20% male. And as we all know, elementary schools need male teachers. Male students need to see male role models and we're not meeting that at the elementary ed level. When we get to middle school, again, fairly evenly balanced, 
And by the time we get to high school, specifically orchestra directors, it's a nice 50-50 mix. This is um, throughout the United States. And then when you get to band, that's where you see a complete switch. So the majority of high school band directors, this was a study from, uh, this was a survey um, from 2017. So I'm not sure if those numbers have pushed much, but um, we're looking at 30% female teaching at the high school level. And that was in line with what I was seeing in my own school was that my students were starting out in one direction and ending up with elementary positions. Now, I would like to say at the onset that there is there is nothing wrong with any of these professions if you decide you want to go into elementary versus going into high school. However, as we all know, the higher paying jobs tend to carry with them sometimes more prestige. They certainly come with a higher paycheck. They are more competitive. And that was more of my concern. Um, and when we get to the collegiate level, here's the big question. So how many director of band positions are held by females? So we're talking collegiate, head of a band program, and that big number, dun, 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 drum roll, 10%. That's actually up from 6% from five years ago. So we're making some progress in that regard. But it is sort of alarming that we have so many women that are being educated and yet only 10% are getting to the highest paid positions within our profession. Underlying causes. This became, these are the statistics that, that sort of blew my mind. And this particular disparity was the thing that got me looking into how can we fix this? Um, what caused it? What can we do? Um, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll share, I'll share some of these tools with you. Um, underlying causes, well, inequity starts early and so do assumptions. Um, this was a big thing. Um, a lot of studies have been done on representation, which is meaning um, showing examples in illustrations, photographs of um, both men and women participating in music. Things like elementary um, textbooks, posters that are used to put up in band rooms and in general music classes. Um, representing a variety of people. Um, and that showing a discrepancy, that disparity, um, is something that is being addressed now by music publishers. It's those things are getting better. Um, also adults versus children. So frequently a, an elementary music ed textbook might show children of equal um, gender participating in music, but then when they show professionals performing, it tended to skew towards male representation. So um, how we're depicting children, children end up having a positive um, experience about thinking about participation, but those gender roles get skewed at the professional level. And that may con contribute a little bit to those discrepancies we saw in those statistics. Um, the good news is that, like with a lot of these things, those perceptions and stereotypes, um, those perceptions can be reversed with experiences and trying to change what kind of representation you show in your classroom. Another area of disparity, which as flute players, as the majority of people here, I think we, we might know a little something about that, and that is instrument selection. Um, gender associated preferences begin early. In 1978, there was the first major study done on sex stereotyping in instrument selection. And the good news is most of those studies have shown that it's not so much the biases of the band directors. That was a big assumption was that a band director would see a stereotypical female and say, oh, you should play the flute or the clarinet and that men, young men should play the, the brass instruments and the drums. It does not seem to be a contributing factor, the individual biases of the band directors. Nonetheless, um, students and adults ended up having these sort of stereotyped um, gender preferences that ran along a continuum where, not surprisingly, flute was deemed, this was back in 1978, flute was deemed the most feminine of the instruments um, and drums were the most masculine with a cello and saxophone landing squarely in the gender neutral middle. Um, 
what some of these later studies in the 1980s and 90s demonstrated was that a lot of factors came into um, selecting an instrument. And one of it was certainly um, your peer group. And uh, if, if you saw someone that looked like you and you identified with, you were significantly more likely to play that particular instrument. Also a separate study um, analyzed children's music preferences and their instrument selections. And it was, it was shown that female students tend to be attracted to the smaller sized instrument whereas male students chose an instrument for its volume, that male students were more attracted to loud instruments. Um, and again, much like representation, these things can be reversed with experiences. So if you're a middle school band director and you're doing instrument selection, one thing you can do to offset the disparity in your own band is to perhaps have um, the percussionists demonstrate on small instruments maybe bring in a piccolo trumpet, maybe have someone playing a very loud clarinet, um, thinking about ways that you can use the small versus loud um, preferences to kind of skew it in a different way to balance out your band. Of course, having students presenting on those instruments, have male flute players showing what the flute can sound like, have female tuba players come in and play, um, or better yet, just have multiple students um, on each instrument. That can make a huge difference in um, eliminating disparities within the instruments. As for our larger statistics about um, disparities, there were certainly a lot of underlying causes. Why women were less inclined to um, be hired in the collegiate or high school level. One is, of course, general social and historical trends. Um, and these are quotes from a historian, Vicki Eekler. She's a professor of history at Alfred. I should say she was. She has passed away. She was a professor of history at Alfred University and wrote a lot about the gendered origins of the American musician. And one of the things she talked about was in terms of music as a profession in general, in the 18th century, it was problematic because music was considered not masculine enough for men, nor feminine enough for women. And by the 20th century, um, music performance was sort of given a female role and whatnot um, that sort of encouraged women to participate in music, but more like um, socially, as opposed to being a, a, a band director or a collegiate professor. You were expected to perform, but for more social purposes. And so a lot of it is we're overcoming centuries of um, stereotypes. Another one was certainly that women were not part of the military band tradition. So if females, if band directors are getting their um, training from the military or for being in marching bands and half of the population is, is not going to be a part of that tradition, it can make one feel a little less secure about teaching um, marching band at the collegiate and high school level. Um, this is not to say that we haven't had women in military bands. And in fact, um, a woman named Jill Sullivan has published two different books on early all-female bands that were in all branches of the service as early as World War II. Of course, they're wearing heels in the marching band, which I just loved. Um, <laughs> these were not women that were implemented into the traditional military bands, but rather separate entities that were all, all women bands. And in fact, they were noted for their, quote, feminine appearance, and they were expected to appear feminine at all times, as you can see by the skirts and heels. They were encouraged to wear makeup and have long hair as well in these ensembles. So although women did have some experience in military bands, being an acclimated member of that was something that didn't happen for quite some time, which no doubt led to women feeling perhaps less, um, less experienced to tackle those roles as educators. Uh, the other big underlying cause where women were largely left out um, of the conversation were collegiate marching bands. 
And it was, even though some colleges did allow men and women, a lot of them kept them to be male only until the passage of Title IX, which was in 1972, which is not that long ago in the scheme of things. And just because Title IX required colleges to um, allow women to be in the marching band didn't mean that they always played by the rules. As I was reading about particularly the University of Michigan. And if I've got some Michigan fans, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you mad. Michigan wasn't the only school that was doing this. <laughs> but the legendary director of bands in 1972 at Michigan, George Cavender, he knew about Title IX and knew that he had to allow women in, but he didn't advertise it. And he didn't tell his staff and he didn't change the recruiting posters. It just said, still wanted a few good men to be in the marching band. So he just chose to kind of ignore it. He did have one female student who asked to join the band and he assured her that they were full that year and they would not be accepting any new females. So just because Title IX came around doesn't mean that it was immediate um, and, and welcomed. When, when pressed further, the particular student who was turned down eventually went to the college newspaper and the newspaper interviewed uh, Professor Cavender and he explained uh, that marching band is a more violent physical activity than would be proper for a lady. Um, and we certainly couldn't excuse a woman from rehearsals if she had female problems. That was his reasoning and rationale. Um, <laughs> So although it was in place, there were exactly zero females in the marching band at Michigan during that first year. And it wasn't until the second year that uh, finally 10 women were accepted. But even then it wasn't good enough, right? Because just to add insult to injury, the very first halftime show featured Rodgers and Hammerstein's There Is Nothing Like a Dame. And then they also followed by the music to The Stripper in which a, uh, they formed an image of a woman on the field and then had her skirt elevated higher and higher as the song went on. So uh, we get excited about things like Title IX, but it took years before the culture was changed in that regard. And then of course, another underlying cause of, of discrepancies are orchestral trends in which at the professional level, um, certain um, European orchestras were still having all male orchestras and again, if a female doesn't have the professional experience um, of her male counterparts, she may feel less inclined to enter the profession at the highest at the highest levels. And when they're banned from those, it's hard to, to have a seat at the table. Um, continuing on, other causes for the disparities. Um, the one cause that really bothered me was the lack of males participating in elementary. Um, uh, in high school uh, elected music programs. I don't think that number has gotten better. I suspect it's only gotten worse. Um, in general, that could be explained by a K-12 education system that has been kind of largely pro-female since the 1980s. A real push was, was given to, to make sure that women were treated fairly, but what an unfortunate side effect occurred um, was that our male students kind of got lost in the shuffle. And we have seen an, a, a rapid decline in test scores, in graduation rates, um, in the success of our male students going through high school. And that is in line with what we're seeing in participation in music classes as well. So that is, that is troubling for a lot of things. Um, some people will say that it has to do with um, female teachers, uh, more female teachers than male now are in those systems. And so students may find it more difficult to identify with their teacher. Um, often boys statistically tend to have more um, uh, learning problems and learning disabilities that may go unaddressed in school, which would account for their um, declining test scores and whatnot. And schools tend to ignore that many male students are struggling academically and tend to stereotype male students as having problematic behaviors that could contribute also to the decline in music participation. Um, of course, another reason why we don't see a lot of females in high school and collegiate uh, positions is just a slow turnover. It takes a long time. A lot of these people, <laughs> 
get a get a really nice job at the highest level and they don't want to retire for a long time. So there aren't as many positions and the turnover rate is is lower. So even though women are now getting the experiences that they need and they are participating in the military and in collegiate marching bands, there's still no positions for them. So that um, is a problem why that's a slow growing number for us. Um, one thing that troubled me was in many of the studies I read in a lot of the case studies that have been done on women in the profession, women complain that they have been actively and inactively discouraged from pursuing certain fields. Um, unfortunately, I have noticed that too, not just at my institution, but at others, the way we perhaps um, mentor a female student and say things like, you know, I think, I think you'd be great as an, you're so good with kids. You'd be great as an elementary school teacher, you know, and we think we're helping them, but it's that sort of um, the, the, um, sort of the tyranny of low expectations that we're, we're not necessarily um, asking them what they want to be doing or what their interests lie in, but we're kind of inactively shuffling people into a certain career path based on our own biases and our own ignorance, um, intentional or otherwise. And finally, this one came up a lot that there were a lack of role models for both students and educators. I personally asked my own students who had gone into the field, hey, why did you not end up going into high school teaching like you thought? And a lot of them said, you know, everybody I was observing were male and my student teacher, the supervising teacher was, was male. And I just, I didn't see myself. I didn't know how I could be me on the podium. And I think that ends up being a really huge um, issue is, is not having as many role models as needed. The other thing I always like to address is why should anyone care, right? So there's a disparity. So more women are finding jobs at the elementary level. So more women are playing flute than playing the drums. Really, why should anyone care? Well, the short answer is that students are missing out on the talent and perspective of half the population. That there's, there's things that different people bring to the table and we're missing out on, on those, um, um, those skills, which are important for everyone. Also, it does make it harder for a woman to find a job if she really wants to aspire to a collegiate or high school position, um, but is actively being discouraged from pursuing that. It, it, it adds to a frustration for those people seeking work. It, when one ends up at a position that they had not intended to go for, that ends up being decreased job satisfaction. Um, also lower retention rates, not just for teachers that are entering the profession, but also one study showed that the students that play in band at the middle school and high school level who play an instrument that is um, the majority not their gender, right? So the male flute players or the female trumpeters, those students are at a significantly higher risk of dropping out of the band program. So for those of us that are interested in, in maintaining and retaining top students, um, bearing in mind that having those gender disparities, for whatever reason, do contribute to a higher turnover rate, which is disruptive to your program and not good for anyone. And the other reason why people should care is that the schools themselves are actually being punished in a way for having these disparities. One thing that was so interesting to me was discovering that the state of Florida did a research project of a grad student in Florida at Florida State University, um, looked at assessments for marching band, and another student, graduate student, looked at Virginia um, concert band assessments and noticed that the schools that had female band directors, either the marching band in Florida or the concert bands in Virginia, those teachers on average received lower scores for their band, that they were evaluated in a harsher way and the bands themselves and the schools themselves got lower um, rankings um, and fewer competition wins than the bands that were um, conducted by men. And what the Florida State study was particularly interesting because after noticing that trend, that particular student got a hold of um, the marching band tapes from several schools and sent them blindly to a group of California educators who would have no knowledge of the Florida schools 
and the names of the band directors and the genders were not um, revealed to those. And when done as a gender free assessment, um, not surprising, they were ranked on equal level with their male counterparts. So definitely suggests that there is some disparity in how um, females that are at the top of the profession are being evaluated by other people. And that is troubling for the schools. I almost hate saying that statistic uh, when I give this presentation because I feel like a hyper competitive principal at a school might use that exactly as a reason not to hire a woman. You know, thinking like I, I, all we want is winning and trophies and, and a female, but I, I put that in there because I think it's an, it's an important statistic for people to understand. Also, why should anyone care? It does contribute to the wage gap between men and women, that if women are um, consistently uh, going for the lesser paying jobs, it is going to contribute in that regard in a way that's negative. And finally, why should you care? It's illegal to discriminate against women. That's a big one. Yeah. So how to start the conversation. This, um, this is important because once we know what's kind of going on in the situation and the trends, it's really hard to get people to change or to get attitudes to change. But I wanted to provide folks with some tools to at least get the conversation started. Um, a lot of economists have come up with 18 or some, in some cases, 15, some 20 contributions to the wage gap. Some of these we can do absolutely nothing about, right? So for me, I like to look at these and think about what, what are the things that I can do something about and what are the things that I can't so that I know what I'm up against and that you can use your energy to change what you can. On the one hand, Sometimes there's legitimate gender bias that somebody just doesn't want a female band director at their high school and they just are going to be biased. That happens. Also, the education gap, that was a big one that that women by and large didn't have as much um, education as their male counterparts, that gap is actually closing. And in particular, in music education, um, females with PhDs in music education have outnumbered uh, their male counterparts. Um, the DMAs in conducting still skew slightly more towards men than women, but we are closing that gap. So that's something you can do is, is make sure that you're educated. Also, um, Economists do point to the fact that sometimes women choose an occupation with lower pay. Um, and there are natural gaps in one's work experience. Women are significantly more likely than men to take a maternity leave as opposed to a paternity leave, which are becoming more, more common, thankfully. Women are more significant, significantly more likely than men to um, after school join the Peace Corps or to join um, religiously affiliated um, um, mission work and things like that, which will lead to gaps in work experience and then leads to a wage gap. Also, women are less likely to join the union, which can help with your um, wage increases. And also, so things that you might be able to do something about, agreeableness. One would think that being an agreeable person would have its benefits. As it turns out, the more agreeable you are, the less likely you are going to earn more money. I have no idea why that is a thing, but it is. So perhaps we can all work to be slightly less agreeable and then we can find ourselves making more money. All joking aside, um, you know, the idea of, of negotiating a salary and things like that, there can be um, differences in how people handle that in ways that will lead to um, a higher salary. Height, I sort of throw that up as a joke, but the, the, all things equal, the higher, the taller of the two candidates will probably end up with the job. Can't do anything about that. So confidence, that's a big one that can lead the more confident um, the employee, the more likely they are to get paid better and also perceived leadership abilities. And those are some, some of the things we can do things about and some we can't. For instance, what can we do? Well, a lot of women studied in, these, in the case studies 
when asked what it felt like to be the only female at a collegiate band director uh, conference. All joking aside, they did say they appreciate the benefits. For instance, waiting in line at the washroom. Ha ha. But more importantly, as institutions are becoming more conscious about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, they are demanding that on-campus interviews be conducted in a way that shows diversity. And so even though statistically there may be only 10% um, women um, getting those top band positions, there may be closer to 30, 50, 60% women candidates being brought on campus for interviews. So it can tilt the other way um, as institutions are demanding that they see a diverse applicant pool. It will give a little bit more um, benefit to, to getting yourself on, on campus for the interview. One thing that can also be done is many of the women that were interviewed in the case studies I read recommended that you join a women's group, a professional or social one, so that you get the mentorship you need, you have commiseration, you can connect with other people in the profession, find those role models you need. And yet, quite a few of them also said, don't join a women's group. <laughs> that if you want to acclimate into a male dominated profession, part of it is don't distinguish yourself by your gender. So, you know, I feel like that's something that, you, that each individual will know for themselves. They know what makes sense to them if they want to join the women's group or not, but you can find um, positive reasons for, for either. Modifying your expectations, this one's a big one. Um, Anticipate the problem. If you know what's gonna happen and you can plan ahead about it, then you can sort of determine how, how you want to react or what you wanna say. And that's where, again, where I think mentorship comes in, in handy. Um, I had some of my own students who were student teaching at uh, the collegiate level, or sorry, student teaching at the high school level. And part of them had a really negative experience with that, which led them to not want to pursue that professionally because their student teaching experience was one fraught with somewhat sexist stereotypical behavior. They just thought, I don't wanna be a part of this. So I'm gonna take the other job. But if they knew it was coming, then they could anticipate. Case in point, one of my students, um, we had discussed the possibility of what to do if you're asked to make photocopies and run secretarial things instead of getting podium time figure out a way that you can politely ask for the work that you the need, that you need or the experience that you want. And knowing that that might happen, she said she was not surprised at all when she was asked several times in a row to go on a coffee run. So right when marching band was scheduled to rehearse, she was sent to take coffee orders from all the assistant band directors and run to Starbucks and, and come back and she felt like she was really missing out on a significant part of the rehearsal process that she should be observing. And so what she did, cause she kind of knew what was gonna happen was that the, by the second week of this, she went to Walmart and bought a $15 Mr. Coffee coffee maker and a $5 bucket of Folgers. And when they asked her to go on a coffee run, she said, I really don't wanna miss out on any more rehearsal time. So I just brought coffee for everybody. Feel free to make it yourself. And it was a really subtle way to sort of ties into my next point to creatively solve a problem. Um, and that's something that we all have to navigate, right? Do you call something out? Do you act assertively and aggressively? Do you report people? Do you laugh it off? Do you tolerate it? Um, and that, that's a really difficult area to navigate. Um, but I think if you know what's coming up, and you know, then you can sort of map out your reactions in advance that can help your experience so that it doesn't feel like something you don't want to pursue professionally. And again, mentorship, mentorship, mentorship is really going to help students and young professionals as well. Also, and as much as I don't, you know, I, I point out these disparities, both in how we're treated, um, our likelihood of getting a job in the workforce, opportunities that have been denied for us. Um, 
and I don't want this to feel like I'm, I'm in any way, you know, victim shaming or saying, you know, it's on you. But I do think we can take some ownership in being as educated as possible so that when we enter the workforce, we can have the experiences and the um, confidence that we need. So I often, nowadays, I encourage my freshmen and sophomores in college to join the marching band. A lot of schools still have all brass marching bands. So if you are female and you're, you know, you've got largely female-based flute and clarinet and oboe and bassoon sections, and you have to play a brass instrument to be in the marching band, you may feel like that's not open to you. Well, pick up a brass instrument and join the marching band so that you can have the experience that you need. Also join a percussion or world music ensemble. That was something else that several of my students anecdotally mentioned. They felt less secure about having to coach a drum line and they thought they wouldn't have to do that as much at the middle school level. And also the big one was jazz. That being um, a flute player, we don't always get to be in the jazz band. And so um, I strongly encourage my music ed students to learn about jazz and join a little rep group, an improv group, so that you, if you get a job that does have a jazz component, you don't have to feel left out of that. When you think about the instruments that are, again, brass instruments in an all brass marching band, or the instruments that are typically in a jazz band, those are instruments that tend to skew more towards male students participating. So you can imagine those students feeling more secure taking over those teaching roles. It's a nice little pitch to take your methods classes seriously so that you can learn to be competent on all the instruments regardless of your gender. And then other things that have nothing to do with our musical training, let's just make sure that we're, we're doing all we can for assertiveness training, honing our interview skills, um, researching the biases in others so that we know um, where those, research, those biases may be and we can anticipate them. Um, this one was an interesting one that statistics show that women who use their middle initial on um, resumes are less likely to all else equal get an interview than either their male counterparts or females who don't use the middle initial. Does that make any sense to me? No. Should it matter? Of course not. Should you be upset that it does matter? Yeah, but honestly, for me, leaving out the middle initial was easy to do. Right? That was a concession I was willing to take to see if it gave me some kind of an edge. Learning about little subtle things that you're okay with um, adjusting or modifying can help you to get the job that you're looking for in an otherwise biased environment. And then I put this in sort of as a joke, but, but a study showed that women who speak between 30 and 60% of the time in a conversation are perceived as being stronger leaders than those who speak less or more. So I just tell people, just learn to talk between 30 and 60% of the time, which is hard to do, but 50% is right down the middle. And it is easy to know if you're a naturally introverted person, if someone else is doing all the talking, make sure that you try to inject yourself into the conversation. If you're a talker like me, just remember to be quiet when other people are talking and you can, wage, you can gauge that balance a little bit better. Um, another thing that you can do is again, watch for biases, be aware of them. I was delighted that, well, I was horrified and delighted, but one of my own students, came to me and shared that in her music education class, they were doing mock interviews and the teacher had handed out job descriptions to each of the students and then they would go around and practice interviewing for them. I thought that was a wonderful uh, professional development opportunity. But I was horrified to find out as my student discovered, all of the male students in the class were given descriptions of high school teaching positions and all of the women were given little cards that explain that they would be interviewing for an elementary, a middle school position, or an assistant band director at the high school level. And I don't think my colleague did that on purpose, and I'm not trying to call him out on it, but my student watched for it, and she noticed it, and she waved her hand and said, I would like a different card, please, because I plan to enter the profession as a high school band director, and I would like to interview as such. Um, and I thought that I was delighted that she caught it and very politely 
and with humor, um, got what she needed and switched. Also remember that words matter. So when we're trying to eliminate some of these um, inequities, when we're trying to eliminate um, biases uh, and perceptions, I always try to follow the journalist's workable definition of equality and that being reversibility. If you switch the genders and say the same thing, does that sound weird? For instance, I would, on a personal note, um, my husband and I both work and also have two wonderful children and are both active parents. Not once has my husband ever been described as a working father. And yet I get called a working mother all the time. It's not a term I'm, it doesn't bother me, but the reversibility sounds awkward. So before you go to compliment someone for being a working mother, ask yourself, would you comp compliment a man for being a working father? And if that feels weird, then maybe eliminate it altogether. And that's an important one to, to bounce off ideas. Um, before you comment on a woman's tone or attitude, consider whether you need to comment on it at all. Um, women are more likely than men to have things like their personal appearance, um, um, be mentioned in a rec letter. And in fact, uh, letters of reference for women are seven times more likely to include references to their personal life, things that don't matter to the job. And so they shouldn't be mentioned at all, but they can skew things in a way that's preventing women from getting a position. And as a great resource, Arizona, actually I put Arizona State University and I am so sorry, it is the University of Arizona. I have the wrong university there, but the University of Arizona's Commission on the Status of Women has a wonderful website that talks about rec letters, terms of reference. Um, we all wanna write, and I'm just gonna quote from them. We all want to write honest letters, but negative or irrelevant comments such as, she has a challenging personality, or I have confidence that she will become better than average are twice as common for female applicants than saying um, they're a rising star, right? Pointing out that the person doesn't have any experience is significantly more likely to happen when writing a rec letter for a female than it is for a male um, candidate. So we can all watch the words that we use how we're treating our students and also our rec letters. And that held true. The Arizona, um, University of Arizona Commission pointed out that those rec letter issues, women are just as likely as men to be writing those things. It's not just the male uh, rec letter writers. And this is from their website, um, talking about particular adjectives that tend to skew towards a um, more gender biased, Women are more likely to be called conscientious, dependable, diligent, dedicated. Well, that's not a negative thing necessarily, but men are often referred to by their skill set. Um, the adjectives tend to be stronger, um, outstanding, accomplished, insightful, resourceful. So they give you a list of some things that you can use when you're writing rec letters and referring to your male and female students. Also, watch for your own biases. I was guilty as any with the uh, rec letter things. So it's important to watch out for that. Um, recent book about leaning in, I always say, I, I try to encourage my female students to, to try for those things. And I also tell them, and I do this myself, if I look and see a male colleague applying for a grant that I somehow convinced myself I wasn't ready for, or maybe wasn't qualified for, and then I see a male colleague who's actually going for it. And I think, well, he's, not any more or less qualified than I am. Why, why, should, why should he be doing it and not me? I find myself pushing myself a little bit more and challenging myself to lean in and try for those things that maybe I'm not ready for, but can grow into the position. Um, and in ways that we can, we can lean in, I encourage my students to apply for the bigger job. A lot of students, both in my own anecdotal collection of information and also in the case studies that I read that have been published, a lot of women said they started out with a middle school position believing that they would get more experience and kind of get their feet wet and, you know, 
that first year teaching after college is just a mess. You don't know what you're doing. And so a lot of teachers felt like if I do middle school first, then I'll wait until I'm ready to get the bigger job. Whereas a lot of their male counterparts weren't waiting until they were ready. They just applied for the big job. The bigger job tends to, again, come with a higher paycheck, which is significantly important. Also, give yourself permission. Allow yourself to try, you know, and not worry about what people are going to think if I'm not ready or I don't want people to think that I'm, that I'm thinking I'm better than I am. I don't want to be arrogant. Give yourself permission to try for something big. And understand your own insecurities. Um, this does um, fall along gender lines a lot of the time. I think that gap is changing, but in terms of mentorship and, and having encouragement, a lot of successful women said while they had the idea to apply for a job or a grant or go into a profession, it didn't really do it until someone else said to them, hey, you know what, you can do this that somebody else sort of gave them permission or gave them um, validation to, to pursue it. And I, I think sometimes women need that validation. I know I, I did, I was fortunate enough to have mentors. I was fortunate enough to have both in, in my home life, personally and professionally, they were always telling me, just do it, go for it. You're good enough, you can handle it. You ought to do that. And I, I think that, paved the way for me to confidently go for things that maybe I wasn't quite ready for. And find, find, find a role model. This is really important um, to seek somebody out and ask for their experiences and ways that they can advise you. Um, and I think that really, really important to remember the role model came up a lot um, as a, not having any as a deterrent for women but um, having one was a great encouragement to one's professional development. Um, and finally, what can be done? More research. As I say again, there's an entire voice of people that are, that are non-binary that don't fit in these parameters and their voices deserve to be heard as well. So we need to do more research, not just um, on men and women, but um, non-binary students and professionals. We also need to do more research in the areas of, of instrumental music and choral music and update our statistics, because once we know what we're up against, it can be a lot easier to actually do something to make meaningful change. So if you have any questions, oh, just on time. Sorry, I spoke a lot and fast. <laughs> But if, if any of you think of things that come up, um, you are certainly welcome to email me at any time, julie.hobbs at uky.edu. And um, yeah, if people have any comments now, um, yeah, feel free to pipe up. Julie, I had a quick question for you. Um, very interesting presentation, fascinating. Um, do you think that um, college, the women that are in collegiate high school, or collegiate band director positions are, have the tools and the knowledge and are encouraging more women to, to do it. So, so for example, I, I mean, I was just thinking like here at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, we have a women head band director, but I'm pretty sure all her graduate teaching assistants are male. So I guess your your thoughts on that and is other than you discussing it, like is is this actually a conversation that is happening in the collegiate band world? Because that I that, that's how I live, so I don't know. I'm just curious. Yeah, and I th I think in general it is. And I've noticed just if anything else, the, the rise um, of organizations like the Women Women Band Directors Association is now an international organization in Canada and the United States. Also, they have chapters in every state. Uh, this has popped up even in the last five years. While some of those organizations have been around for a while, they're really gaining some traction now. So, I, and um, Girls Who Conduct is an organization that's relatively new that is trying to foster mentorship um, in instrumental conducting among women. I think 
while not obviously not every school is going to have those kind of mentorship things. And again, some women genuinely in the interviews I read, some women genuinely felt like they didn't want to make a big deal, that they're trying to acclimate into this profession. And it was their choice to just do the work. And, and I think that's a legitimate choice to make. So I'm not criticizing anyone just saying like, I'm just going to kind of ignore that there's a disparity and just, I'm going to be the best I can be on that podium. And, and that is me being a role model and I'm done. But I do, I see programs like at the University of Minnesota, the director of bands and also the marching band director are both women and they are active um, as, as mentors. And I know they both studied under Dr. Ma Mallory Thompson at Northwestern who actively mentors. So I think people are having those conversations and I think you see it in the, you see it in the, in the grad students that you're attracting as well. But I wonder in those situations, if you see a female instructor and all, you know, all male grad students, I mean, I, you know, the applicant pool is still, you know, disproportionate. So I think the conversation has to start earlier and younger. Um, but I, I, I think we're having yeah. them. Yeah, I'm encouraged. I yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So I just thought, I just thought, like, wow, her, all of her band, I'm pretty sure all her GAs are all male. So <laughs> and for what it's worth, you know, so. I've, I've served on a search committee a couple of times now. Um, and we're looking at that. So when someone's applying for a collegiate job and we're, they're at a college, like we actually took a look at who are your grad students? Who are the kinds of students that you're attracting? Because that's what we want for our program. If you've got a diverse, a diverse pool of students that are drawn to you, that's what we want drawn to our university as well. And I think, I think if you're not having those conversations, you should be because people are noticing that. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jennifer, for posting the, the Arizona Commission. Um, I think that's a fantastic resource. I caught myself making all kinds of errors um, in rec letters, you know, and you think you're not. I think we have to look to ourselves. I think we have to take an honest look in and, and realize like, well, I, I am a woman. So I, how could I possibly be discriminating against other women? And realizing um, I had a perfect example of um, two very accomplished students who were quite equally gifted musicians that decided they wanted, one was going to dental school and one was going to medical school. And they asked me to write the rec letter. And having read all this, I went back and looked at the two rec letters because I thought these are equally competent students that I would have just, bragged about and I went back and looked and on average rec letters for men from from the University of Arizona site rec letters for men are 16 percent longer than rec letters for women and I thought well I wouldn't have done that and nope mine was nine percent longer for the male student than than the female student but it was longer and I was horrified you know so I think we all have to take an honest look at ourselves um, and do that um, Oh, yes, I can send you. So, Nicole, you asked about a link to the study of instrument selection. There's actually a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, research on instrument selection. That's been a hot topic. The first one was in 1978, and then the rest sort of piled on and piled on. Um, Nicole, if you don't mind sending me your email address, I'll send you um, the link, because right at the top of my head, I don't have it right here. But I will I will make sure you get the, the, the articles. I was swimming in a pile of references. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay, does anybody else have any other questions or comments? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Well, thank you so much, Julie, and for a fascinating presentation. Um, oh, uh, Lois Lewis Cooper said, what do you consider to be the most common stereotypes applied to women? Yeah, I, I think that if you're, I think in the profession, particularly, I saw this being on a, on a search committee, it's either truly believing there's no problem and that women are treated exactly the same as men when the women experiencing it don't think so. Um, and also just believing that if you're a woman that you are more likely to be good with, with small kids. I've had students that have been asked to do babysitting jobs during school hours instead of student teaching, that the band director had a childhood, you know, childcare emergency 
and ask the student teacher, but wouldn't didn't ask the male students. You know, there's this sort of um, expectation that because you are female, your behaviors are going to skew a certain way. In fact, one of my colleagues even asked me, genuinely wanting to know, like, so why is it that most of our students don't go into college or high school? Is it that they don't want a college job or is it that they prefer elementary ed? And I thought in the middle is a whole bunch of stuff. Like that's exactly the kind of sort of stereotype is the expectation that, well, and the family, that's the other one is the family balance. That one was mentioned a lot that women were encouraged to do elementary ed because you might want to have a family and that will give you your weekends free as opposed to high school. Well, what about all the dads that want to have good relationships and be good parents and have time with their family on the weekends, you know? And all the women that are making it work, that they figure out a way to be a really killer high school band director with a great weekend marching band program, and they have a couple kids too. Like that's a that's a big one. And I even saw that in interviews. I mean, I shouldn't <laughs> try to to call anybody out, but I, I I heard it in interviews when candidates would ask us, "What do you like about your community?" And some of my colleagues to the female candidates pointed out that the schools are great for your kids. And I thought you didn't say that to any of the male candidates. Like who, maybe, maybe she doesn't want to have kids. Maybe she doesn't, maybe she has dogs. Like maybe we should find out about them. So I think, think making assumptions about one's personal life and how that may translate to a job preference or a job skill, I, that's the one I see probably the most. Okay, so if anybody else has any questions, um, feel free to email Julie. I put her email on the chat. And thank you so much for joining us, Julie. And um, um, join us for next week's virtual event. Um, and I think I think that's it. So great, thank you.